Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be going over a concept known as Markov chains. Now Markov chains are really important in a whole bunch of applied sciences like physics and um, they pop up all the time in statistics. So what is a Markov chain? Markov chains, well they're a mathematical framework that help us understand and describe a chain of events. So say we have a chain of events that one leads to another and so on. Specifically, we can use Markov chains to describe a situation where we can move from some kind of state to over to some other state. And we know the probabilities of these different transitions happening. Now, you might be thinking, isn't this how most chains of events work? Why is, why is this Markov dude getting so much credit for it? Well, there's another subtlety to it, and to better understand it, I'm going to need to introduce you to stochastic processes. And if you already have a good understanding of how stochastic processes and random variables work, I'll skip over to the next timestamp. But for now, I'm just going to give a brief overview of what stochastic processes are. Let's start with a simple example. Say you're rolling a dice. You know the set of possible outcomes. So every time you roll a dice, one of these six numbers will get chosen. Um, we'll call this our sample space, omega. And let's denote the outcome of rolling a dice as x. The value of x is random. If the dice is unbiased, it is equally likely to equal any of these six uh, options. So x can take on any of these. And it's for this very reason we call x a random variable, because its value is determined by this random process. So, for example, the probability that x equals 1 is equal to 1 over 6. And this is different how you'd approach other variables, like the ones you meet in calculus or algebra or physics and chemistry, where you know the value of x equals some specific number and you can figure out how it changes with time etc over here the value of x is much more nuanced it depends on some random process and we don't know exactly what it's going to be we just know how likely it's going to be something specifically for this x because it takes on a set of discrete distinct possible values so it can only equal these six whole numbers we call x a discrete random variable. So um, you can't roll say three and a half or you can't roll a dice and get pi for example as your result. So that's great, we understand what discrete random variables are. So let's say we roll the dice three times and let's call the first outcome x1, the second outcome x2, and the third outcome x3. So now we have a sequence of three random variables and all of them follow the same probability distribution. They're from this same sample space. And we have a pretty good idea of how likely something's going to be. So say getting, I don't know, six, three times in a row is really, really unlikely that, so it's really unlikely x1, x2, and x3 are, are all six. And that's fairly intuitive. Now let's take this a step further. So instead of having three random variables, let's say we roll the dice every minute. So in the first minute, our result is x1, which is again sampled from omega. Second minute, it's x2. Third minute, it's x3. Fourth minute, it's x4, and so on. Um, and this can go infinitely or until we decide we get tired or bored or both and stop rolling the dice. But this is an infinite sequence of uh, discrete random variables. And this sequence of random variables is called the stochastic process. Stochastic is just a really fancy word for random. And we can denote this sequence of random variables representing this stochastic process using curly brackets. So this is one of the ways we can denote a stochastic process. It's just saying we have a sequence of xi's where i is our time index. Stochastic processes are almost always indexed in time. But you, I'm sure you can think of examples where, say, I represents space instead of time. So uh, it could be, say, the number of crop pests in the morning in four different fields owned by a farmer. So say the farmer owns four fields and the number of pests that appear in them can be a random variable. So now our index is space. So almost always time could be space and it could be anything depending on how you 
put it forward for your problem. So this is a mathematical framework. We can we can take it and we can apply it to our problem. Something I should note about our random variables is they're, deno they're always denoted with capital letters in most statistic textbooks and research papers, etc. And the convention is to use uppercase letters to denote random variables and lowercase letters to denote possible values they can take. So if, if we wanted to go more abstract in our dice example, say we had some random variable x, it could take on the value x1, or it could take on a value x2, and so on, and we denote these possible values by our, our lowercase letter when we don't know what they are. Great, so that's good. We know what discrete random variables are, and we know what stochastic processes are. So what's any of this got to do with Markov chains? Well, we can express the state of a chain of events, so state when time is 1, state when time is 2, state when time is 3, and so on. We can express this as a stochastic process. Moreover, and this is where we understand what exactly a Markov chain is, we can express something called the Markov property. Uh, I'm going to write it out mathematically first, and I'm going to explain what each term in it means. So, the Markov property says the probability that our next state equals some value, um, let's say b, given our first state equals some value a, so say we're in state a at time t, time t plus 1, we're at state b. That's exactly the same as saying the probability that our state t plus 1 equals b given we knew um, all possible states it was in previously. So that goes S1, S2, all the way up to ST equals A. So what this is saying is the probability of ending up in state B, given you're at state A over one time step, is exactly the same no matter how you ended up at state A. And this is often referred to as a history independent property of Markov chains or the Markov property, which says if you're in some state, and you want to transition to another state out of all possible states you could transition to, this probability does not depend on how you ended up at this state. It doesn't depend where you came from. And something really important is it also depend doesn't depend on what time it is. So probability of going from, say, at time step t plus 1, you're at b, given at time step t, you're at a. So the probability of going from a to b in one time step is exactly the same for all possible time steps. So say in the future you're at t plus k plus 1 time step, given your, you start at state a one time step ago, these two probabilities are exactly the same. And this is really important because it emphasizes that there's no specific important time period. All time periods are equivalent. Um, there's no time where a given transition is more likely than another transition. The likelihood of moving from one state to another only depends on the state you're at in your current time step. And this is, this is basically the Markov property. A lot of this is very abstract and hand wavy, so I'm going to go over a couple examples of Markov chains. Our first example is going to look at what we call a random walk. Random walks are super interesting. Um, I'm going to cover them in much more depth later on. But for now, let's say we have some agent on the line of integers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, um, and it goes infinitely in the other direction as well. And let's say this little blue fella is our agent. At, now, in the random walk problem, at every time step, uh, so time is discrete in this case as well, our agent will e either move left or right with equal probability. So a half. So agent could hop here, then next time step hop here maybe, next time step hop back, next time step hop forward again, and so on. So it's, so it's a stochastic process. It's We know places where it could end up, we know how likely it's going to end up there, but we can't see for sure where it's going to be. Uh, in math terms, this problem is called the unbiased because it's equally likely to go forward or backwards a random walk over the integers 
in discrete time. So that's a lot of words, but um, you, unbiased, e equally likely to go forward or backwards, random walk, it's like sometimes it's referred to as the, dr the drunkard's walk as well because they don't exactly know where they're going, they're just jittering about, so hence a random walk. Over the integers, that's fairly intuitive because line of integers. And the last bit in discrete time means our time index for our state is always essentially these natural numbers. Nothing happens in between, say, time step 2 and 3. Nothing happens in between time step t and t plus 1. This concept of having two and a half seconds doesn't exist. And this is the main thing we're going to look at when we introduce Markov chains. Yeah, this random walk is a Markov chain and we can write down its transition probabilities, i.e. the probability of going from one state to the other, as follows. So the probability of ending up at state x plus 1, so one step to the right, given you're currently at x is equal to a half, because we're unbiased, and similarly probability of ending up one state to the left given your at state x is also a half. So that's, these are the transition probabilities for our problem. So our second example of a Markov chain is taken out straight from David Silver's reinforcement learning lectures and this is known as the student Markov chain. It's fairly intuitive to understand we've got these set of states and we've got these transition probabilities between the states and these just these numbers just tell us how likely it is to move from one state to the other and you can see how general this Markov chain formulation is because we're doing something very general here we're describing how an agent exists from state to state and how likely it is to move from one state to the other we can see all sorts of interesting phenomena happen here where say say you're in class and you end up 50 percent chance going to facebook and you have a really high chance of staying in that facebook because 90 percent of your time gets spent there and it's a 10 percent chance getting back into focus in class you can just hop from state to state something important to note here this state in square doesn't have any arrows leading out from it it's called the terminal state once you reach there your episode your game your whatever you're studying it's over an easy way to see Markov chains is to try visualizing them um, using such state diagrams and a cool resource you can use to do that is this website here by Victor Powell and it's uh, satosa.io slash Markov and what you see in the top right is a matrix and it represents the transition probabilities from one state to the other. Um, this matrix is sometimes called a stochastic matrix or the transition matrix associated with a given Markov chain. What we have here is our agent hopping from state to state. Um, th the thickness of the arrow represents how likely a transition is and we can see a lot of the time it ends up in this sort of loop where it, it doesn't exactly get stuck in but it ends up spending a lot of time there. And yeah that's a brief introduction to Markov chains. I'll be going over them in much more depth later on but I hope this video was helpful.